Pasko and uh, thank you for reading. Kapag ang Pacquiao, si Paul, uh, I don't think there will be a problem for that. As he shares their fights, but every once in a while, even Michael also becomes a little bit more. That's the opening bell for Round by Round, presented by Eastern Communications. Maboy Pilipinas, welcome world. I'm Bill Velasco. And I'm Ryan Sangalia. Boyet Sison joins us later on in the show. All right, Ryan, three weeks ago, when our Olympic medalists all came back from Tokyo, uh, the three boxers who had won medals, uh, among the things they've been talking about is uh, their plea to colleges here in the Philippines to bring back boxing. You know, in the, up to the 60s or so, there was boxing in the NCAA. Our old uh, dear friend Joe Cantada was, in fact, an, an NCAA uh, champion himself. But there's always been some resistance. You know, every so often somebody uh, dies by accident. Uh, what is the status of boxing in schools in the U.S.? It doesn't exist. I mean, you can't even play dodgeball in America anymore because it's, you know, they, they view it as schools view it as exclusionary. Uh, how much more so would it be you're punching people in the face? So we're, we're at a point now where like, uh, I, I couldn't even imagine it. You know, I, I know that that had been a thing uh, uh, many generations ago, but I couldn't see this generation doing that. All right. So there's actually... How do how do people get started in amateur boxing in the U.S.? It's not through the school system. No, it's not through the school system. It's like it's usually like um, I want to say police athletic leagues are great. Uh, you know, it, it's a great way for um, uh, police to offer something, you know, to younger people in, in the communities. They have boxing gyms. They run boxing programs. Uh, I, I always say that you don't choose boxing. Boxing chooses you. It's the circumstances in your life. Um, a lot of children, they can't get along in, in, in team sports situations. And the only way that they can connect with, like, say, uh, uh, a positive male uh, role model a lot of times is through a boxing trainer. So, that, you know, in my case, that's how I got involved in boxing when I was, like, 14, 15 years old. Like, I was, you know, I was a juvenile delinquent. And, like, the only place I could go that was positive in my neighborhood was a boxing gym. So, uh, it's usually in, that, in those kinds of circumstances, but uh, you won't see it uh, really pushed in schools, not like, uh, you know, in some other countries that they have. Yeah, here in the Philippines, uh, in 2007, uh, Senator Lito Lapid then pushed a bill called Senate Bill 60, which uh, was set to establish a Philippine Boxing Academy, which was supposed to be run by the games and amusement sport, but uh, that, that never pushed through. And then there was this, uh, you know, big furor over uh, the 16-year-old kid. I believe it was in Tarlac. He died after a, a, a bout. And all of a sudden, there was a, another call for them to ban boxing in schools. Because in the UAAP and NCA schools, there, there's no boxing. But other smaller school leagues in the provinces in particular, uh, they have their own uh, boxing tournaments. And, uh, you know, there I think, I guess the parents are more relaxed about it and because uh you know it may be eventually a way for them to make some money and get out of poverty mm -hmm. now i i always wondered how that would work because when you think of boxers you don't think of uh students going to ateneo or la salle and you know i always wondered how that would work because you there are a lot of athletic uh, talents that come from the provinces right and like you're not gonna you're not gonna find boxers in Manila. that's that doesn't exist because if you have options to do things like uh, getting punched in the head for money, you know, is really low on like the totem pole of things you're gonna do. But yeah, you, you do more. You box. You do boxing more for fitness and for recreation, and you're actually trained by, for example, the Elorde system. You know, they they have actual pro boxers training you, but you don't actually spar or hit anybody or get hit by anybody. Well, you can, but then like it's like you'll pay the boxer to let you throw punches at him. I've seen that. I'm just like. <laughs> how are you going to unless you get punched in the face? Um, but I, I always wondered how that would work out because maybe uh, people would care more about it if there was school pride on the line, right? So um, we see how it works with basketball, how it works with um, 
uh, with volleyball, uh, particularly for women, and you know, in certain socioeconomic levels uh, for for soccer, football. Um, if we could do that with boxing, uh, that would be pretty interesting because you know, it's something about the Ateneo versus La Salle and 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 those sort of rivalries and. And you know, you can, versus the San Beda, you know, those things exactly. Yes, if you take it to the NCAA, um, there's something that just gets people excited, and then that's where I think with, with boxing, where, where it lacks the grassroots uh programs, you could do that with a collegiate system, uh, if, if, if people were so inclined. I guess that works in a situation wherein uh, you know, kids are delinquent, they, they have a loose relationship with their parents, uh, but in an urban setting like we have in a uh, Metro Manila. And the kid lives with his or her parents, and you know they're 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 watching them all the time. They won't allow them to get hurt in a recreational sports setting. But then again, you know, parents let their kids take self defense classes. They learn, you know, karate, taekwondo, even arnis, where they're hammering each other with sticks. Uh, would would that mean the concern is mainly about getting hit in the head a lot in boxing? In the other sports that you mentioned. Um, you can sort of mitigate the risks, you know, with harness, for instance, it's, it sticks and, you know, you're not, you know, actually like stabbing each other and things like that. Um, you know, with Taekwondo, uh, in competition, it's almost like tag, you know, like I, I believe I saw someone in the Olympics get disqualified for knocking a guy out with a kick, which I thought. For hitting him too hard. Means, yeah. For hitting yeah, him too hard. That means yeah. win. Like, you know, imagine telling someone, yeah, how'd you win your grandpa? How'd you win a gold medal? Some guy kicked me in the face really hard. So he got disqualified. Like, oh, how did you, how did you, how did you win then? But um, yeah, with the, boxing, the shame, the shame of it all. <laughs> with boxing, the idea, we cannot get away from what boxing is. The great shame of boxing and the great appeal of it is it's literally life and death. You know, you're going to get punched in the head and there's no way to make that safe. You know, in a uh, hundred or so years of organized professional boxing, they've not found a way to actually say, okay, this is how we make it safe. The way to make boxing safe is to ban it, but we're not going to do that because uh, people are going to be fighting for money. Uh, you know, they've been fighting for money since time, uh, people, since civilization began and yes. you know, boxing in, in, in some form combat will always be around. That's just human nature. Um, so there's always going to be that issue, but the, there's just, there's something about boxing, the individual um, being accountable for himself, uh, even if you don't become a world champion, I believe boxing makes you a better person, right? Like uh, I know doctors, lawyers who started out as boxers and, and got um, the discipline in their life. Some people go through other things, you know, tough love to become who they are and, and to self manifest. And for a lot of people, it's boxing. So uh, you, you can't tell me uh, boxing is, 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 isn't the greatest thing for a lot of kids uh, who really need that sort of structure in their life. And, you know, uh, like here in the Philippines, of course, basketball is the number one sport, mainly because you can't do boxing every day. But uh, in the provinces, it, you know, it's very primal. You don't need equipment. You basically, it's like swimming. Basically, it's what God gave you, and that's what you're working with. So uh, for a lot of poor people, they don't need equipment. They can train with, with barely anything. I mean, we've seen how many documentaries of poor countries in Africa and Latin America where you know, they, they just literally get sacks, fill them with sand and use them as punching bags. Well, I guess uh, when you think about it, then the science often speaks for itself, too. And there's a German study that said that boxers, uh, 10 boxers have been dying a year around the world since the 1900, except, except for the 1920s, around the time boxing became legal in the Philippines, where there were 200 boxers who died that decade. So the main concern really is there is no way you know, they've tried sh shortening the fights. They've tried adjusting the gloves. Uh, there's really no way, Ryan, right? Yeah, well, you mentioned in the 1920s, uh, all the fighters who died from, the, uh, you know, in boxing, uh, you know, you come, what comes to mind is the great Denzio Cabanella, the Olongapo kid who died in 1921. Yeah, uh, he, had, uh, he held uh, three weight divisions at the same time, which is crazy. Yeah, but, you know, we've learned certain things. Like, okay, you need to rest after a long fight. You can't just go back into another fight, you know, right after a tough fight. Uh, you need to have, you need to allow your brain to rest from fighting and from training, right? Because let's, let's be honest, a lot of these injuries actually start in sparring and then you, you get into a fight where, you know, you, you're dehydrated from trying to make weight and all these other issues and long fights and you're pushing yourself to the limit. Um, you know, we've, we've learned certain things about boxing, you know, that, um, but
But sometimes, you know, there's nothing you can do. Like I remember Patrick Day, you know, a boxer who I was close with. Um, yes. I knew him from the amateurs. He passed away, I believe, in 2019 um, uh, after his fight with Charles Conwell. And that just looked like a regular boxing match. There was nothing that suggested in the fight. It wasn't like, like when Lavander Johnson um, died uh, in his fight with Jesus Chavez, that looked like something where someone was going to get hurt because uh, Jesus Chavez had power, but not enough to knock you out, but enough to hurt you over a long period of fight. Charles Conwell, the fight with Patrick Day, that didn't look like anything other than a regular boxing match, yeah. except Patrick Day went down and he didn't get up. So, uh, you know, there's no way to really eliminate risk from boxing. Um, so anyone who gets in the ring, I don't care, you know, what kind of fighter they are, they're always assuming a risk. Um, so there's always going to be that concern for people. The abolitionists for, for boxing will always have that great, um, that, that, that argument, you know, uh, you know, you know, we, we, we can say, no, boxing isn't dangerous. Of course it is. It has to be a choice that someone makes to get into that ring. Right. Um, and, you know, an informed choice. Sometimes, you know, younger people do get in the ring, obviously, like we're talking about 10 year olds, 11 year olds, you know, you have to have uh, adults in terms of mature, responsible officials who are looking out for the boxers, making sure people are not taking undue, um, undue punishment. But we see this in gyms. I mean, yes. there are some trainers who are pretty crazy. Like I, I remember the first time I got really badly injured in sparring and that was the last time I ever boxed again, you know? So um, sometimes you have these trainers who are not responsible and they allow people to uh, young people who don't know the risks to get, uh, to get hurt. And that's where I think uh, you need training. You need um, officials who are educated and, uh, and responsible. A couple of days ago, uh, promoter uh, Bob Arum said that uh, he saw in Manny Pacquiao a diminished fighter. Now, you know, here in the Philippines, we don't really say things like that to a person, either to their face or publicly. It's something you whisper, uh, something you discuss in private. But for Manny Pacquiao, who worked with Bob Arum for a very long time until, you know, that disaster in Australia, uh, how painful is this and how real would this statement be coming from Bob Arrow? Well, for Manny Pacquiao, it, it's got to hurt a lot because Manny Pacquiao is a very prideful person. And, you know, he's, he's someone that um, always looks at challenges and tries to overcome them. Like, I mean, like the bar always constantly raises you. He, he's always looked at things like that. But I, I think when it comes to Manny and, and Aram, their relationship was so long and there was, there was a real paternal thing there. I remember when Pacquiao got knocked out by uh, Juan Manuel Marquez, yeah, Aram had fight, to, yeah. yeah, he had to do his job as you know the promoter and like say, yeah, no, we're gonna promote the next fight <clears throat> and we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. But I could see in Bob's face that he was personally worried, you know, personally upset by Manny's loss. Um, but he's not saying anything that's not true, right? I think okay. Manny will even admit that. So this and, was not uh, this is, this was not a one-off thing that a uh, ring rust or for whatever reason. What Bob Aram is saying really is that Manny is going down here. I mean, he's 42 years old. You know, yes. but, but no one's expecting him to be the, the same Manny Pacquiao when he was 24. So I, it's kind of like, yeah, of course he's going to say that. It, it, it's, it's the truth. But now, because Bob isn't making money with Manny, you know, it doesn't hurt his pocket to say the there truth. There you go. If yeah, he, I, I remember, I remember you know, if I can interject a little bit, I remember when he was saying, that you know, Shane Mosley is uh, over the hill. He's uh, not good enough for Manny. And then a few months later, Shane Mosley is the perfect opponent for Manny Pacquiao. So, yeah, yeah. You're well, right. Bob <laughs> has a way of. Uh, Bob is probably the greatest boxing promoter of all time, and uh, he knows how to sell fights with his words. And you know, he doesn't let um, what he said the day before get in the way of making a buck. <laughs> Alternative facts, right? <laughs> Or just alternative uh, alternative paychecks, I guess. The next thing I wanted to talk about was this simmering criticism, which is starting to leak out into the mainstream uh, media, about real professional boxers who fight on the undercards of these celebrity events, you know, like uh, the, the Jake Paul, Tyrone Woodley fight. Uh, on the other hand, if you're the boxer, you're saying, I got to make a living. This is great exposure for me. But then you're on the undercard of someone who's not a quote unquote real boxer who's just there for the money and to get clicks and likes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing about boxing. It's, you know, um, 
star power, you know, comes with a certain uh, privilege. And Jake Paul, uh, for whatever people want to say about him, um, he's one of the biggest stars in boxing. Like he moves the needle. Um, Adrian Broner had a great saying, you know, about boxing. He says, it's all about cashing checks and having sex. You know, so it's like, you know, it's all about the bottom line. At the end of the day, if you can, if you can sell tickets, if you can sell pay-per-views, you know, you can do whatever you want. Uh, Conor McGregor had another thing. If you bring something to the table, you get a seat at the table. And, and Jake Paul brings a lot to the table. He's not the best boxer we saw last night. You know, I mean, a lot of guys, I, I, anyone, not just in the top 10 of whatever division he wants to fight in, but in the, with a winning record, we'll beat him. But it doesn't matter because, uh, you know, these are people like that want to just see whatever Jake Paul can do. They want to see a train wreck. They want to see uh, Jerry Springer type of drama. And that's what Jake Paul brings. Unfortunately, that is our reality. Now, here's today's Eastern Communications Fearless Fighter, Ryan. So for today's uh, Fearless Fighter, I'm going with Jennifer Hahn. Jennifer Hahn is challenging uh, undisputed lightweight champion Katie Taylor uh, this weekend in the UK. And the reason I'm going with her is this. She was a world champion at 126 pounds. She's moving up to lightweight. She has fought just once, and I believe in the last two, three years. And she's coming off not just having one child, but two children since then. And so she had to, she had to take off 75 pounds, uh, you know, in this training camp since May. Um, I just spoke with her. She's, um, she, she's over there in the UK uh, right now. Her children are at home watching the, the, the fight on TV this weekend because they're too young to travel. So, um, yeah, she's really up against it. She's taking on one of the best fighters in the world. And she's doing so after uh, becoming a two-time mother. 75 pounds. And that is our Eastern Communications Fearless Fighter of the Day. <laughs> and now we will turn you over to Boyet Season to talk about the history and the evolution of the boxing glove. Thank you, Bill and Ryan. Now, let me talk about uh, the evolution of uh, boxing gloves. Now, in ancient times, the art of combat was very much present as a means to fight wars, to conquer or defend territories. Now, yung mga warriors, yung mga, yung mga lumalaban, eto, syempre, kailangan parating ensayado, kailangan uh, sharp yung mga skills nila. So, ang ginagawa nila, Sila sila nagpa-practice, insayo, parang nagsasparring din sila. That eventually, through time, it developed into sport as we know it. Now, what started as bare knuckle events, meaning wala silang mga gloves-gloves, it eventually gave way for the need or pangangailangan na kailangan protectan nila yung mga kamay nila. So, nagkaroon ng mga glove. Now, for many of us who enjoy boxing, evidence from uh, websites like uh, Olympic, uh, olympics.com and titleboxing.com suggests that uh, the, this dates back to Egypt around 3000 BC. And by the late 7th century, boxers were already using some form of glove to protect their hands so that they don't break them when throwing punches. Now, Greek fighters wrapped their hands with oil softened ox leather strips called himantes. Ito mga himantes, kung makikita nyo, and then, eh, pinilambot yan, mga balat ng, balat ng, uh, balat ng uh, ox hide no? na pinilambot using oil. Now, eventually, this evolved into a cestus, which is the ancient form of a boxing glove as we know it today. Ngayon, kita nyo, Paiba-iba yung mga forma, you know, iba-iba yung pagkakagawa. Siyempre kasi, ano pa naman nun, ano pa naman na yun, hindi pa naman sophisticated yung manufacturing. Wala pa manufacturing. Sila-sila gumagawa ng mga, ng mga gloves sila, pati na rin yung mga, ano, yung mga weapons. Pero yung mga weapons, of course, mga swords, mga, mga sibat, eh, medyo na perfect, hindi naman na perfect, pero sanay na sila gumawa nun. Pero pagdating sa mga guantes-guantes mga gloves, hindi pa masyado. Now, Itong mga, mga gloves na to were made uh, with strips of leather that were occasionally fitted with blades or spikes. Imagine that. Ha? May mga may mga spikes. no? Hindi na gloves talaga na pang-insayo na pang, ano, pang, pang lang. Eh. Talagang weapon. No? 
uh, bagay na pwedeng makapatay or makasakit na ng tao. Pero, alam mo, ginagamit nila yan, hindi na hindi na talaga pwedeng gamitin para pag-insayo or pang-spying. Dahil pag ginamit mo yung ganyan, may mga spikes, spikes pa sa, sa, sa fist, eh, ang nangyayari, eh, may namamatay. No? <laughs> so, pati yung mga nangyari, nagkakaroon na sila ng mga boxing matches talaga, eh, malamang, malamang sa hindi, eh, may namamatay. Now, nung, nung uh, the fall of the Roman Empire, nag, uh, nung nawala na yung Roman Empire, natigil po ang boxing. It stopped. I mean, you know, they, they stopped the practice of having boxing matches or boxing fights. Pero, mga kaibigan, it resurfaced in the 17th century in England, organized, uh, which is an organized amateur, uh, an, an organized amateur uh, boxing officially began in the year 1880. Now, originally, only five weight classes were contested. And then yung bantamweight, not, which did not exceed 54 kilos, featherweight, which does not exceed 57 kilos, and lightweight, which does not exceed 63.5 kilos, the middleweight, which uh, does not exceed 73 kilos, and uh, pagdating naman sa heavyweight, eh kahit anong timbang na yan ng bigat. No? Ngayon, talking about boxing gloves naman, the first padded boxing glove was actually introduced around 17, the year 1743. Uh, now, at that time, the padded gloves were only used in training and were even considered to be unmanly Sipin nyo yan, as uh, most bouts, as I've said, were generally bare-knuckled affairs. Kung baga walang gloves, yung actual na labanan, wala pang gloves-gloves nun. Kinagamit na nila yung gloves pag magtitraining. Pero pag sa actual na laban, walang gloves ng mga panahon na yun. Pero, kasi itong, itong uh, boxing, mga kaibigan, uh, nung mga 19th century, ano pa rin, considered pa yan as a hobby, eh, more than an actual profession. So, yung mga taong sumasali o lumalaban nung mga panahon na yun, eh, hobby lang sa kanila yon Kasi uh, kailangan din nila magtrabaho. Actual na trabaho. So, kailangan hindi na, hindi na i-injure yung mga kamay nila. So, uh, ganun yun. Now, so kailangan nila magkaroon ng proteksyon sa kanilang mga kamay dahil nga kailangan nilang kumita ng pera. At itong uh, kwento na to ay galing sa ESPN at uh, galing yung kay Nigel Collins. But with their hands now having more protection dahil nga mayroon ng... Uh, Diba, may gloves na nga, uh, na may konting buffer, may pumipigil na, may, may, may nag-absorb na ng intensity ng punch. Eh, ang nangyayari naman, eh, mas malalakas naman ngayon na suntok ang kanilang uh, uh, tinatapon or uh, binibigay. At mas maraming suntok sa ulo na uh, which puts which placed fighters in a higher risk for irreparable brain damage. Now, the use of gloves slowly gained acceptance as more structured rules and safety measures were adopted by the sport. Now, the boxing glove today is, well, obviously much more advanced and regulated. The weight, the design, and the amount, and the type of padding is carefully considered. In today's boxing game, training and sparring gloves are tailored towards protecting the fighter and his or her opponent. We will have part two of the evolution of the boxing gloves very soon. Now back to Bill and Ryan. Thank you, Boyet. And that's the final bell for this episode of Round by Round presented by Eastern Communications. I'm Bill Velasco. And I'm Ryan Sangalia. We're on Facebook at 6 p.m. Monday through Friday and on our YouTube channel right after. So like, follow, share, and subscribe now. Now now. Tomorrow, we're going to have Dennis Principe, Boyet Season, and Nisi Kashano working the fights for you. See you on the next episode of Round by Round. Take care.